And um, yeah, so today I want you to go through the um, MCMT uh, diagnostics just to finish it. And we were almost done last time. So uh, the first topic is that for today. And then we're going to discuss the paper that I asked you to read. And I enjoy reading all of the uh, responses, actually. And I wrote down some notes. And I um, we're going to discuss that after we're done with the diagnostics today. Okay. So let's see what was the yeah so this again as we go through might also be good um to to keep in mind that later when we're going to discuss the paper uh, according to some of your comments i think many of you start to think about like the pros and cons between the method that we talked about in class as well as one that um Gelf, Gelf, Gelf and Smith in 1990 when they proposed we have like different approaches right and then some of you talked about well for one of those maybe MCMC diagnostics might not be necessary or maybe too much to do so those are actually good questions and good comments so I'm just saying that as we go through the diagnostics and finish this section I think it's a good idea to keep in mind like go through what we care about in terms of diagnostics, and then keep this in mind later when we move to the paper discussion, what they are all going to be right. All right, so we talked about MCMC convergence. I mean, ideally, we want to draw the posterior distribution from the posterior distribution, but we uh, typically don't have it, so we're trying to like um, approximate it through something we call a uh, Gibbs sampler. And then give samplers under the bigger uh, frame of Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques. And we talked about the first MC, which is Monte Carlo, uh, Markov chain, and that's talking about the previous uh, time point or like affecting the next time point. Okay? And then the second MC is uh, Monte Carlo, and then those are the ones that we looked at before, which should be like generating draws independently from the distribution and summarized based on that. So at the end of the day, we get MCMC, which does have this Markov chain property, but also has this um, Monte Carlo property. But then in the end, like we uh, did earlier last time, uh, certain things like staining, that kind of pra uh, practice, is important to make sure that we do get independent draws in the end that we're able to summarize as uh, posterior. So, so one thing we talked about is uh, discard the initial steps, if you remember. So these are the cases where uh, you might start the chain, say like start the MCMC chain at a particular value that later on, like the starting value is very far away from what the posterior would be. So we ideally want to discard, uh, discard those initial values so they won't affect the later ones. So uh, the default, like we, we talked about the people do the burning period for P percent of the draws. Default is 50, but you can play with um, other things. And then when you make uh, the inference in the end, you're making inference with the remaining 100 uh, minus 3 percent percent of the draws. And um, later we also talked about the thinning. So in the end, you might have even less draws than that. But uh, but this is a good uh, and important to keep in mind that we don't want the initial values of the chain to affect the summary because the initial value might not be in the uh, sample space of what the posterior should be. So we do this burning step. And then if you uh, coat your deep sampler by yourself, then you're able to um, uh, just chop off the first 50%. Yeah, but if you do it in JAX, uh, I think I showed you last time that you can easily um, just insert what the burning, like the burning number of draws that you want uh, in the um, round.jax function, and they will do it for you. So they will run this adaptation uh, steps, and then they will do the burning steps. And then how many samples that you ask for JAX is going to be, at the end of the day, how many draws that you're making summary of. Okay. All right, so this is that. And then we also talked about how to check the MCMC mixing. So that's more about what we call a trace plot. So pretty much you're just plotting uh, the draws uh, by index, and then you're just looking at how well uh, the trace plot can show that the MCMC chain is being mixed. So ideally, you don't want something like keep going down or keep going up. You will want something, a chain that looks um, like exploring the space pretty well, going up and down. And then that will be uh, what you'd be um, expecting to, to see and hopefully to see. So we talked about um, how, to, how to do it. And then I show you the example of, um, that's the trace plot of mu in the uh, Gibbs sampler that we did for the 
consumer ex expenditure survey. So this is the first plot. And then you can see that, it, um, so especially pay attention to the y-axis, like the range. So you will know that that's um, <coughs> at the end, um, like the, the posterior range of this mu, you can see that it's between A72 to A78, and it's bouncing back and forth, up and down pretty well. So that's indicating that the chain is mixing well. Okay, and I remember last time I was trying to tell you, okay, what, what will be a chain that is not mixing well? So you might see something like, um, let's just say like a particular range, and then uh, after burn in, okay, after the adaptation, you still see uh, draws like this. This will be very typical um, sticky chain. Okay. When you run pretty complicated models, you see that a lot. I see that a lot when I do my own research, so that's um, pretty um, often to see. And one way you can do it, like we said, is you can run it longer. Okay. Or another thing to check, which we're going to go to in a minute, again, as a review, is to look at this ACF plot. So this is autocorrelation plot, right? And then that's telling us how, also like in a way, telling us how sticky the chain will be. So for example, here, Right now, in this example, the trace plot is mixing pretty well, right? And then it's not surprising to see on the bottom right that the autocorrelation plot is really good too, in a sense that you have very low autocorrelation. But if you're going to have some trace plot like this, I bet your autocorrelation plot is going to be going down slowly. Okay? So again, autocorrelation plot, the x axis is the lab. Yeah, so the longer. So I, like this one is good because except for at time zero, immediately when you get to lag one, the autocorrelation drops to close to zero, meaning that the draws are pretty dependent. Okay? And then of course, if you have a sticky chain, the autocorrelation plot can look like this. And the last time I was saying, it's super important to pay attention to the numbers on the x-axis. Say for example, if this is 20, and then you start to see that at 20-ish, the autocorrelation plot becomes, I mean, the, the autocorrelation at that lag uh, becomes close to zero. Then that's a good indicator of how much thinning you want to do. Because this is saying that at lag zero and say lag 19, the autocorrelation is still pretty high or like relatively high. But then if you feel okay that starting from lag 20, the autocorrelation is low enough, then that means that you should save every other 20 draw. So this is another, so all of this, you should look at them together, and I think they together actually tell like a, like the same story or similar story, but you should look at things from different angles. So trace plot, that's what you see. And then the ACF plots, we just reviewed it, and then, um, so for example, here that was uh, still the new case, and I mentioned about the effective sample size. I think that was roughly where I left last time. Yeah, so it, you can read it from the um, summary as well, and it's in this column called SSEFF, so it stands for Effective Sample Size, I think. And what it means is, so remember, the sample we did is 5,000, right? So we draw it for 5,000 times, meaning that we get 5,000 draws of mu and then 5,000 draws of C, yeah, mu and C as you can see over here. Mm -hmm. So these are MCMC draws, meaning that they should be some dependency across the chain, okay, for mu and then for phi. And however, as you can see earlier in the plots, the trace plot as well as the autocorrelation plot, they seem to be very little dependency, right? So again, I was saying that the model is pretty simple, so that's why you don't see like much of correlation as you run the chain. And in addition to looking at those plots, Another thing you can look at is effective sample size. So different software computes it differently, but you can understand it like, like a general idea of effective sample sizes. So we do have sample of 5,000, which are MCMC draws, right? MCMC, Markov chain Monte Carlo. And this effective sample size is computing, say, for the fixed number of MCMC draws that you have, how many draws, how many independent draws it is equivalent to. And that tells you the effective sample size. Okay, so here, for mu and phi, both are 5,000. Okay, meaning that all of them 
all of those draws for 5,000 draws for mu, as well as 5,000 draws for phi, they can be considered pretty independent, which again is in line with what we saw previously in those plots. Okay, so this is another important um, aspect to check. And sometimes you might see, just yesterday I was running something like a logistic regression, and I got, I think, one of the parameter, the effective sample size was as low. So I ran it for 5,000 times, I think. And then um, there are two parameters. One of them is pretty high, like the effective sample size may be something about like, in the 2000s-ish, and then the other one is in, in the low hundreds. So sometimes, and then of course for that, I will probably have to do more thinning or have to run it longer. Yeah, but I just want to say that sometimes when you have like the data maybe have some high correlation to start with, or maybe if the data, or if the model is complicated enough, then like different parameters are gonna behave very differently, okay? So for MCMC diagnostics, it's super important that you check all of them to make sure that nothing weird is going on before you proceed. To, to do a posterior summary, okay? So that's just um, just a suggestion. And for me, I just need to, I think I ran it longer. And yeah, at the same time, I remember the um, autocorrelation was pretty bad, I think, even after like a lag 50 was still pretty high. So again, um, that logistic regression, if you know about um, the method, shouldn't be that sticky. So I was a little bit surprised. Maybe it's because of the data, the particular data that I was working with trying to do the prediction was was tricky, but then, um, yeah, sometimes you do get pretty highly correlated draws, and then you either run it longer, or or you should do both. I think you run it longer as well as do more thinning, and then again, at which point you thin, it's important to look at the auto correlation plot like this down here. Okay, so right now we don't have like because we don't cover complicated models, but soonish when we move to the next unit when we start to talk about Bayesian hierarchical model. I'm sure when you start to run it using JAX, you're gonna to start to see like high autocorrelation plots as well as sticky chains, that kind of stuff in the um, trace plot. And then those will be, I think, that will be the good time for us to actually perform serious MCMC diagnostics. Okay, so here is the model is to a simple, and then we're just covering the basics, like what you should be looking at. But, um, but later in the semester, you will use all of this, um, I think, much more often, okay? And this is the thinning I was saying, and in um, JAX, it's here. Mm -hmm. So for me, I only did thin one, uh, because as we can see, five, like the effective sample size are pretty high, for, I mean, as many as 5,000 number of samples that you have, so you don't really need to do much thinning. But then if you determine that I want to save every other 20 draws, you do 20. If you want to do 30, you do 30, et cetera, et cetera, over here. Okay, so this is the place that you should uh, play with. And I should also mention, I think I mentioned this last time briefly as well, that JAX is really, uh, I think, flexible because they change, say, so adapt and burn in, I think no matter how many you ask, that's just how many times that they're going to do the iteration. But they, I think they're flexible in terms of determining the sample and thing. So here, if you do thinning as one and then sample 5,000, they just draw 5,000 times, right? But if you do sample, say, let's still want, but let's say we still want 5,000 draws in the end to summarize, right? But I want to do thinning at every 10 draws, for example. And then I think you can see it because they're gonna be like a progress bar. You can see how the JAX is running. It's gonna take that much longer for you to achieve if you fix everything else, but change this to 5,010, because at the end of the day, the number of iterations that they run is 5,000 times 10, which is 50,000, okay? So they do run the chain that long for you, but they do the thinning for you as well. So at the end of the day, you still only have 5,000 draws that you try to summarize. Okay? So I think that's a good uh, feature, because I think last time I was telling you as well, when I was learning all of this, I was coding by myself, doing all of the Git sampler, and then at the end of the day, I have to determine which draws I want to save, so I have a bunch of loops like at the end to, to do all of the summary. But then JAX is pretty flexible in that way. But you still need to understand how things work. Yes? Will the um, Brennan take into account the thinning too? So that's, so that's something that I don't know for sure. When I look at the progress bar, when I try different things, 
I don't think they care about that. I think thinning only happens to the sample. Like, I think, yeah, so, but maybe I'm wrong. The thing is, if you worry about, like, burning is not good, like, long enough, you can just change it, like, directly by, by, by the number. And I think that's a safer way to do it. I think, yeah, so by the way, like, Jax or around Jax, the particular package that we use, they have a pretty thick menu online. It's a PDF. If you want to read it for fun, feel free. And then if you find out whether they do that for, for you, let me know, because I don't know. And... And I think I told you last time as well that I still don't know what the depth is in, in the way that they write it, but it's, it's, I think the default is a thousand. So I just insert it over there because remember last time I was showing you when you read those plots, especially, yeah, I think, yeah, only actually, only at the trace plot, you can see the iteration here and it actually labeled the index for you, right? So here, remember the adapt is a thousand. Burn in is 2,000, I think, right? And then sample is 5,000. So, like I said, they're going to throw away this. They run this and then throw away. They don't use it. So that's why in the index, you can see it goes from 3,000 to 8,000. Yeah, so that, I think, yeah, I think when mm -hmm. I try it, even without, like, doing, like, adapt, I think they automatically did 1,000 for you. So that's why, for me, I feel like I just want to see what happens. So I keep that adapt in like that particular command uh, in the code. Um, but then of course you can change that number as soon as you start to use that. Okay, yeah. So my suggestion would be if you want to do longer burning, um, just bump up that number. And my feeling is that thinning doesn't affect the adapt and burning period. Because think about thinning, why do you want to do thinning? Because you see very sticky chain, right? And I don't want to summarize those correlated draws. I want independent draws. So I think it makes sense that they only apply the thinning to the sampling process, but then not so much in the adapt and burn in, because those are going to be thrown away anyway. Yeah. So that's my guess, but I'm not sure. So you can let me know if you read the, <laughs> read the menu. Yeah. Again, many different, uh, I think packages like run differently as well. I mean, it depends on how they do it. And um, so if you encounter like a different package in the future, they might do it differently. But the, the, I mean, the general approach is the same, that we want to do the MCMC diagnostics. We want to make sure that we have independent draws that we're trying to summarize instead of the sticky draws. Okay, so that's, um, yeah, that's mostly uh, the uh, output, like the summary. And then, of course, you can see that they give you, naturally, they give you a middle 90% credible interval so that you can summarize. But then, of course, you can also um, extract the draws from the MCMC and then summarize those draws by yourself. Okay, so next time I will demo, because I remember last time we need to make the, the round jacks to work, and then today I do want to discuss the paper. Um, but I'm saying that the summary just provides the summary that what people typically ask for, but you are able to extract those draws and then summarize by yourself. Say, instead of doing a middle 90%, I want to do a middle 95%, then that doesn't help you, right? You will have to extract those draws and then do the quantile function that we used to do, okay? All right, so thinning is what you can do here. And this are, so earlier it was for mu, this is for phi. So overall, you can see that. So by the way, down here, this is the, um, as you can see, that's the histogram of the posterior, okay? And this is uh, empirical CDF, so it goes from zero to one. Yeah. Typically, I mean, I never really pay attention to that. It's just like automatically give this to you all together. But for us, it's mostly looking at this one and this one for diagnostics. And this one, if you're curious to see how, how it looks like that, the history gives you a sense of what the posterior is like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but of course, some of you might not want to do a histogram. I want to do a density plot, and then I can compare like the, uh, the prior and the posterior, then that will be the time that you should extract those draws and then do the plotting yourself. Okay, so there are ways to do that, and we're gonna cover that when, um, when the time comes. And uh, the last diagnostic I want to mention is uh, called this Gelman Rubin di Diagnostics. So these are two famous statisticians, both are alive, and uh, they propose something uh, new, I mean, back in 1992, about how to um, do further diagnostics about MCMC. So, so far, the stuff that I've been talking about is only looking at one chain, 
right? I was saying that, okay, you start one chain, and by the way, in the JAX code, you see that there is one choice here about number of chain. Okay, so for now, like so far, I've been just doing the demo just to tell you like what are the important aspects of doing the um, MCMC diagnostics for one chain. But we did talk about, remember I said, okay, if the posterior is mixing really well, the draw mixing really well, then the starting point wouldn't matter, right? Like we do the burning, we throw it away, and then just summarize whatever is left. But it also makes sense to think that, oh, if I can run multiple chains, and I start multiple chains at different starting point, if my MCMC is going to converge to its posterior, then regardless of where I start, I should arrive at the same sample space of the posterior. Okay, so that's what this diagnostic is about. It's called Galmer Rubin Diagnostics. Essentially, what they're doing. So think about it. If you run multiple chains here, let's do M M greater than one, and you do M separate Markov chains with the same length, and when converge is achieved, convergence is achieved, then draws from different <coughs> chains should all go converge to the target distribution. Okay, so that means in the end. The output from different chains should be indistinguishable. Are you still going to do your like burning, the thinning, all that? But at the end of the day, if they are, then if they are indistinguishable, then they are they are converged. So one way to think about it, because you do start at different points, right? So at the end of the day, you're going to have m different chains, right? This actually is related to the paper. If you start to realize, because the paper back then. I mean, early on, people saying that, oh, I will get there when we get there. But over there, they does talk about, I think they do talk about multiple chains. But then as a diagnostics tool, you can think about, I do multiple chain, each starting at a different point. And then in the end, I want to test if those chains are from the same distribution. Okay. So this is, I mean, in your intro stat or some other stats courses that hopefully you have taken, you probably know about like testing, say, like different samples, right? Essentially, what we have now is we have different samples, okay? And we want to see if they're different enough, okay? If they're different enough, then it's actually an indicator saying that the diagnostics does not pass, right? Because they should be indistinguishable. Yeah, so the general idea in the last bullet point is the gamma rubin diagnostic is actually doing a comparison of within chain variances and between chain variances. So essentially, you have let's say three chains. Okay, so let me just try to draw it. If you have three chains, let's say chain one, chain two, chain three. Okay, yeah. So what I'm trying to do, or in the diagnostic, what we are trying to do is looking at the draws, independent draws after seeing everything. The independent draws in the first chain. We're going to have within the chain, there are some variance across the draw, among the draws, right? And then you have that for all of the chains, right? And that's within. And then the between is comparing, I guess, one pair, two pair, and three pair. Okay? So it's a way to test or to compare the within chain and between chain variances. And it's actually very similar to the classical analysis of variance, if you have heard or used it before, ANOVA. Okay, that's... That's where you have, let's say, if you have multiple groups, and I want to see the within group variance comparing to the between group variance. Okay, so that's the general idea, and then of course the actual like math and stats behind theory behind it is more complicated than you, than you think. But the general idea is that we want to test about the within chain and between chain variances. And of course, they're going to be a statistic for you to compare to. If it passed it, like if it's over that value, then it passed. If it's not over that value, it's not passed. Okay, so that's the general idea. So let me show you how you can do it. So for example, what you can do in Inject is say, this is a demo. Now that I'm going to do two chains. Okay? And you start to see that I start to have complicated uh, coding here because um, you will need to start the chain from a different starting point, and you want to force it to happen. Okay. So earlier, we didn't fit in any kind of initial value, remember? We just let it run. But here, when I'm trying to test out, say, um, doing the Galvin Rubin diagnostics, I do want multiple chains, right? And I do want to start those multiple chains at different starting points. 
So then I will go to justify them. I do start them at different points. So, um, okay, so the way to do it, as you can see, so this is a sample code, so good for you to, to, to use later. So you can see that I created two vector here, and I put them into a, like, it's just easy to read for JAX later, okay? It's just put them into a particular format. But the essential thing here is that I start my first chain with mu equals to one and phi equals to one, okay? And I start my second chain with mu equals to 10 and phi equals to 10, okay? Now I force it to happen, so that's why you see that in the round jax command, you also have this option to pass on your initial values. Okay? So these are the ways that you can do it if you want to force uh, jax to start, yeah, at different values. So this is uh, what you can do. And don't worry too much about the other things. I think it's just helping uh, helping it to make it work and then readable by R, uh, I should say by Jax. And then once you have that, so you see that I saved it, sorry, saved it as uh, posterior underscore two chains. And then what you can do is, in order to get the galvan rubin diagnostics, it's, so we saved everything in this object. And then there's something called PSRF, and once you return that, you're able to look at, um, I think, the, um, yeah, it's just like the, the point estimate and then the upper cryo interval. So again, the details of the calculation, I don't really know, but it's trying to mimic what galvan ruby diagnostics is, okay? So those diagnostics were developed before. Okay? And then, of course, different packages are trying to adapt them into, into their package, so more people are going to be using it. So for us, in order to use JAX to do the Gelman Ruby diagnostics, this is the table that they're going to report, I think. And then you're just going to compare it to what they say down here. If it's below that value, then it's good. Okay. So we won't, again, I don't like, if you're curious, if you want to do this as a project, feel free to do it. I don't know the detail. But, um, and I was reading online, I think um, they were saying that this PSRF is an approximate to the gamma rubin diagnostic. I don't think it's exact. And if you want to know about the exact, just do a Google search, what does it mean, how to do the analysis of variance. They're gonna provide you a lot of information. But for us, um, this is good enough. You know how, like, what to look for and what you want to compare to. So this is, yes. So just to clarify, the multivariate PSR should be less than the target, and that's our good diagnostic, or what do you? Yeah, so good point. So my understanding is this R, I think, univariate, right? Like a variable mm -hmm. by variable. This, to be honest, I actually don't know what they what they compute. Okay. And I'm a little bit surprised that all of them are one, to be honest. But my understanding is uh, sometimes they're not one, and then <laughs> it should be less than whatever the value at the bottom. Yeah, so good point. So again, I don't even know, so I would never ask you to do this. I mean, I don't know how to, how to really understand this, but I understand a general idea of what gamma ruby diagnostics is for, and that's, again, you should run the chain, uh, multiple chains, and then starting at different values, and in the end, to check if the draws from each chain, they all together, whether they're distinguishable or not. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so that's the um, last one, and then if you plot it, you will see that because we run two chains, yeah. you're gonna see more results. I mean, I wanna see more results, but like uh, like you see on the trace plot, is you do run two chains, yeah. But the thing is, if you notice this, we did start one, the first chain at one, one, right? And the second chain at 10, 10. But then the trace plot, again, because we did this adapt and then burn in, so the beginning draws are dropped. So that's why it's not so surprising when you're looking at a duration from 3,000 to 8,000, they converge. It's not surprising either, even when you just want one chain. Yeah, but it's I think like a, like a confirmation from this plot that the chain, yeah, even though you run two, but they both of them mix pretty well, but they also are at the same ballpark. It's the same range, and that's the posterior distribution of this mu that we're trying to achieve. Okay. Yeah, so, so that's good, and um, yeah. So of course, if you want to do Gig Sampler just by yourself, like we did it before, like last time doing this coding for, uh, I think, the uh, normal case. I think we did it, right? 
Yeah, yeah. And then if you do that by yourself, then of course you can always get the trace plot, get all the correlation plot, effective sample size, and the gamma rubin diagnostic from, from some other packages that can summarize those for you. So those are what I'm showing you on the screen right now are the ones that, so when I learned it, this was the ones that I learned, how to get the trace plot, how to correlation plot, effective sample size, and gamma rubin diagnostic if you run the chain yourself and then you just get a lot of draws from the MCMC. Okay, after burning, after thinning. Okay, and then what you do is you're just gonna uh, turn something. So this was the, I think last time when I showed you, oh, now I remember. We did the, the, I think we did do the um, give sampler that I asked you to do exercise of changing uh, like a starting value. Yeah, so this is where we uh, ended, I think, at that point that we save everything into object called out, out, stands for output. And then what you do is you're gonna call a library called Coda, which contains all of this diagnostic functions that I mentioned up here. You call it, so you install it, call it, and then you turn your output into a, uh, let's say, like what I'm doing here is, because the output in the end, I think only, it's a list of few, uh, a list of new, and then the list of uh, feed. And then you have, uh, you put them into a data frame, and then you're able to uh, like name it, make sure, because later you can call them. And I think, yeah, so on the right, I give you a demo of how you can do uh, MCMC diagnostics using those functions that are in Coda uh, to do it on the new parameter. Okay, so I was saying here that you load the library, uh, you put your output into a data frame and make sure that you name it well so you know which one that you're going to extract later. So right now what I have is para underscore post is a data frame of one column of U and one column of B. I name it so so, so I, later I can extract which one it is. So that's why here I want to get my new draws as an what we call MCMT object. So what you do is the Coda package has this function called as MCMC. Okay? So you apply this function to the column of mu, and then you turn this, I name it as mu.mcmc. So you turn this as an MCMC object, and then all of the trace plot, auto core dot plot, effective size, and then galman dot diag, all of those will be applied um, to, to the object itself. And then, not surprisingly, for the gamma rubin diagnostics, you have to run the chain multiple times to do it. Okay, so um, even when you do it by yourself. So uh, this is just some extra information if you ever want to do it by yourself. Okay, but again, I think um, moving forward, we're gonna do a couple of more like self-coded chip uh, sampler. But then moving forward, we're gonna use more of this uh, roundjax package that then you can get the uh, MCMC diagnostics pretty efficiently from their output. But you still need to know why you want to do it and how, how to interpret the results. Okay. All right, so, okay, I'm just gonna include the recap here uh, for the entire Give sample and, and MCMC. So um, we talked about three steps of doing Bayesian inference. For our current case is you have the normal data model and then you have both parameters mean and mean mu, and the standard deviation sigma is unknown. And then this is the case that we start to introduce um, uh, deep sampler. And again, deep sampler relies on the derivation of the full posterior condition, full conditional posterior distribution. Okay? If you can recognize them, then you are able to generate your posterior draws iteratively from the deep sampler. And then we talked about. Either you write a loop function yourself, which we did, or use JAX, which I gave the demo, but we're gonna uh, use it more later. And then of course, uh, important thing to do is to perform MCMC diagnostics. So again, diagnostics cannot guarantee that chain has converged. It can only tell you that it has not. Okay, so whatever thing like sticky chains or like really high autocorrelation, or like really, uh, it, or like the multiple chains does not pass the gamma rubin diagnostics, then that's indication that MCMC diagnostics have not passed. Okay. 
And when you see that solutions include running longer, you have bigger thinning. A lot of times uh, you might want to standardize variables in the multi-parameter model because it can reduce autocorrelation, or I should say correlations in general. Yeah, and then those uh, will help. Okay. So those are good to keep in mind uh, because again, we're working with simple model now, so we don't have too much of the NCMC diagnostics issue, but later on we're gonna encounter more and then those will be the things that you will um, use. I mean, those solutions are both here. And of course, um, how to make sure that you know how to do the diagnostics and what diagnostics tell us. Uh, those are important things to know. Okay. All right. Any questions? Any. Mm -hmm.